and uh, warm welcome to our medi classes uh, lecture series and uh, we uh, as we discussed earlier is basically this is a uh, every monthly lecture series which we organize with regards to the postgraduate uh, learning program and this uh, series will be talking more about obesity which is going to be a very very important topic that we are seeing importantly in terms of childhood obesity which is increasing and there are various issues with regards to that i am really honored to have dr somana uh, who is uh, with us who is part of our team and uh, she has been very actively involved in promoting pediatric endocrinology in west bengal dr somana is uh, faculty at the renowned uh, vivekananda institute of medical sciences kolkata dr sumana welcome and thanks for sparing your time on this uh, weekend uh, she thank will be so much, sir. sharing her expertise about the overall topic i have also got dr sayan banerji who is a fellow in our department of uh, regency center for diabetes endocrinology and research and the way these uh, programs are structured is that we will be discussing initially a bit about theoretical aspects uh, and then we'll go forward with regards to the question and answer session so before we start off dr sumana we like to have your views about uh, how uh, important obesity is as a topic uh, or overall in terms of both clinical relevance for both post graduates as well as for the pediatric trainees i mean it is one of the most common uh, cases that we find in our opds and it has gone up tremendously especially after the post lockdown and covid pandemic as we know obesity has been increasing and it is a global pandemic anyway and often uh, the post graduates uh, when they uh, face a child or an obese child most of the times i have seen that they um, are in a hurry to investigate uh, send a lot of investigations but Uh, you know there is a, a logical approach to the child so that we don't run into unnecessary investigation and over investigations and that is what i think is important um, here that is where i think this uh, series is going to help them to have a logical approach and it is one of the very important topics in terms of exam uh, too i mean every year almost there will be some questions or the other about obesity obesity means uh, excessive fat accumulation which is detrimental to body's well being and health but when we talk about obesity there are certain criteria that we have to follow to define obesity or overweight children and adolescents so there are different markers of adiposity but the most common and the practical one is the body mass index so the other ones that are there are waist circumference uh, of course skin fold thickness by harpent and calipers and of course a very sophisticated ones like dexa bioimpedance and plethysmography but today we are here to talk about body mass index because that is what is usually followed uh, so while defining obesity uh, we have to strictly divide uh, as per the age group so in less than 2 years of age we take the weight for length and when the weight for length is more than 97.7 percentile for the wh growth charts we call a child as obese for more than 2 year olds we take the bmi so when the bmi is more than 90th percentile for the age and uh, sex of the child we call the child as obese if it is between 85th and 95th we call the child overweight you can see in the following charts one is the wh charts for the under 2 and the cdc charts for the to more than 2 year olds now uh, the bmi in the bmi uh, and the mortality shows a j shaped distribution as you can see in this chart what does that mean and where from do we get all these cut offs you know these numbers that we deal with are aren't you curious about that so if we go back and see then actually there have been lots of changes in evolution of these things of this cut off so what happened there was a study where it was shown that the people who had a bmi of more than 25 and um, above and 30 you know there was this bumps acting here and here which means these people had more mortality rates so you see 25th and 30th so these children were more prone to all the all sorts of complications but the interesting thing is indians as a race as an ethnic group they are very special why because it has been seen that even at lower bmi they have more visceral fat distribution therefore they are more prone to develop the uh, the cardio metabolic complications or metabolic x syndrome okay so that's what 
uh, for us, for Indians, the cutoffs have been come down uh, and they have been made like 23 and 27 for overweight and obesity respectively. So for us, it is 23 and 27 respectively. Now, it all started with the CDC charts for the American population. Now, what happened was in the uh, CDC charts, as you can see here, there are eight percentile lines and it applies to all the American children. And here, the they say that more than 85th percentile uh, BMI would be like overweight children and more than 90th would be obesity. So only it happens, it so happens that only it's a, it's a kind of a flawed chart because you see uh, only then we will be underestimating um, obesity in, in our population at least. Uh, and severe obesity would be defined as per this chart that is more than 120% of the 95th percentile, percentile. So for us, CDC charts are of no use to be very honest. So then came the International Obesity Task Force charts. What they did, they took multinational data from six different countries and they used the technique of backtracking. And they found out that um, they took the cutoffs as 30 and 25 for obesity and overweight respectively. So their levels are higher than CDC. So in a way they were overestimating obesity again. So none of these really uh, are helpful for us Indian population. So what happened was Dr. Khadilkar et al, they revised, they applied the same technique of backtracking and, uh, and came out with our very own charts for Indian children and adolescents from five to 18 year olds. They use the same technique. And then what they did was they replaced the above centiles by the 23 and 27 adult equivalents. So instead of centiles, they, we now take the cutoffs as 23 uh, and 27 of the adult equivalents of the BMI. So it's very interesting and it's uh, really uh, wonderful to see how these charts have evolved over time. And now it is perfectly suitable for us, for the Indian children and adolescents. But uh, although BMI correlates uh, beautifully to the uh, fat percentage of the body, it has some limitations. We all know that. Now, what are the limitations of BMI? So as I said, sometimes it doesn't differentiate between the lean mass and the fat mass. So it can overestimate um, with high in, in cases of high muscular built persons. Also in case of puberty, for example, uh, because pu in, in case of puberty, uh, it may not exactly um, correlate the the obesity uh, parameter because if somebody is early pubert puberty, the BMI may be um, higher. Uh, and in case of, as I said, ethnicity and racial distribution, as for the Indians who are more prone to have visceral fat distribution more and at lower BMI can develop complications. So for them also BMI has this limitation. Now coming to the etiology of obesity. So beautifully, the algorithm shows that, as we all know, so there are two arms. One is the exogenous obesity or the physiological obesity, and the other is the pathological wing. When we talk about physiological, what we mean is that the crux of the cases are physiological. That is, there is no definite pathology found in those cases. 98%, as Sir said in the previous slides. Here in those obese children, it's probably due to uh, uh, dietary increased dietary intake and as we'll see later and there is no there is normal growth normal puberty and normal development whereas in the pathological cases of obesity broadly there will be either genetic causes or the monogenic obesity the syndromic children uh, we will uh, uh, also discuss about all those with you know hyperphagia maybe visual uh, disturbances hearing disturbances and uh, maybe delayed puberty and also the hypothalamic obesity cases where there will be uh, pathological like hyperphagia and of course the endocrine causes like hypothyroidism growth hormone deficiency cushings and hypoparathyroidism coming to exogenous obesity the commonest one as i said increased intake so a uh, high calorigenic diet eating of lots of junk food uh, what is very common in this today's children and, and adolescents reduced activity a lot of screen time uh, or maybe total inactivity some genetic predisposition, etc. These are the causative factors for exogenous obesity. But we should remember most of these children are will be following a normal growth pattern, so they wouldn't be short really, and they will attain the puberty at normal age and also progress normally. And they will definitely have a normal development too. 
Now coming to monogenic obesity, uh, so as I beautifully explained the two pathways, the orexogenic and the anorexic and the different uh, neuro uh, uh, signals that um, tend to um, work on the hypothalamus, the ventromedial hypothalamus, uh, defects can occur at different levels like leptin, leptin receptor, POMC pathway and the MC4R receptor levels. And there are these, although these are very rare, but it is good to know about this uh, uh, causes of obesity too. We'll come to those later again. So the thing to remember here is that in, in cases of monogenic obesity, it is going to be early onset, so very early onset. So when we'll take a history, it's very important to know about the onset of obesity. So here in these cases of monogenic obesity, it is going to be early onset obesity. And as I said, there is going to be a hyperphagia. So like a pathological desire for food. They'll be waiting, waking up at night time, asking for food, you know, creating havoc if they don't get food and so on and so forth. And usually the obesity in these cases is severe. So the children will be morbidly obese. Now, as I said, the, the defect can occur at different levels. So there is this chart shows in a schematic style that if, it, if the, the deficiency is in leptin or leptin receptor, usually the common features would be uh, an obese child with delayed puberty and maybe recurrent infections. In case of POMC defect, there will be ACTH deficiency as well here. And the children will have depigmented because of ACTH deficiency and melanocyte deficiency too. Uh, there will be depigmented hair. And for PC1, the proconvert is one defect. Again, there will be ACTH de deficiency, delayed puberty and malabsorption syndromes. For MC4R receptor defects, which is the commonest one of the monogenic obesity, uh, it will be, the, there will be, um, signs of insulin resistance, acanthosis, and maybe tall stature. Coming to syndromic obesity, we have all seen these children in our OPD. So Prada really the commonest one, um, which will present with you know, hypotonia, obesity, and uh, um, uh, hypersomnolence and all sorts of things. And then Lawrence Moon Bardet Biddle syndrome with polydactyly, as you can see in the, uh, in the picture. And then of course, Al Strong. Um, Alstrom, again, we'll, uh, the children come with uh, obesity, retinitis pigmentosa, and then uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, etc. To name a few. These children, we should remember, will have developmental delay, characteristic features of pertaining to the uh, particular syndrome, for example, digit abnormality, as I said, in bardet biddle syndrome, and visual complaints, for example, in Alstrom syndrome. Coming to hypothalamic obesity, as Sir explained beautifully that uh, usually hypothalamic obesity occurs when there is certain insult to this part of the hypothalamus um, in the form of either a tumor or radiation exposure or maybe a trauma or certain, any kind of CNS insult, in which case uh, there will be, the, the children will present with um, uh, hypothalamic obesity and, uh, sorry, and these children present with a pathological hyperphagia, as I said, okay? So coming to drug-induced obesity, again, a very important thing, we should not miss taking a drug history while we approach a case of obesity. And I am sure you all uh, must be knowing what are the drugs causing obesity, but the, to name a few and the common ones would be glucocorticoid, like prednisolone. Uh, and um, so it can be through systemic uh, intake, local intake or inhaled intake, but we should try and uh, keep it to local intake, uh, local route only. And we should try to start at give it low dose and use sparing agents wherever applicable. Uh, in terms of antipsychotic medications, risperidone, olanzapine are the agents known to cause obesity. So there are drugs like ziprazidone, which can be used as alternative if we want to avoid that. Uh, Anti-epileptic is very common. We all know valproate, carbamazepine are known to cause obesity. And of course, we know the topiramate and felbamate are the good alternatives in those cases. Um, SSRIs, paroxetine, amitriptyline are known to cause obesity, whereas fluoxetine and sartreptyline can be used as alternatives. So, um, and coming to the endocrine causes, uh, finally, when we see an obese and short child, as Sir said, the common causes that we need to exclude would be hypothyroidism, growth hormone deficiency, pseudo hypoparathyroidism, and Cushing syndrome. 
we should remember that in these children, the, ch the child would be obese, so short and plump. So height would be definitely affected, which is a very important thing to note. And of course, there will be issues of delayed puberty too. So coming to hypothyroidism, I'm sure you all have seen hypothyroid children. Uh, here is a child, obese, or typical obese, uh, the face shows, you know, if you look at the face, it will be slightly dull looking with maybe protruding tongue. And uh, there you can see the calf muscle hypertrophy, which we call the cockadeber semelain syndrome. And um, as Sir said, these children can have, definitely will have cognitive delay, developmental delay. And of course, there will be compensatory rise of FT4, TSH almost in everybody with normal FT3 and T4. So we need not uh, start thyroxine therapy unless the TSH is really high, more than 10, or there is uh, evidence of autoimmunity in these children. So please be aware of that. That is a very important message for all. Mm. When it comes to pseudo hypoparathyroidism, you can see the uh, short fourth metacarpal, the brachymetacarpia sign, and there will be hypocalcemia, so Vostek sign, and of course, intracranial calcification will be there, and subcutaneous calcification will also be there. These are the common pointers uh, to diagnose pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So the, when we do a biochemical examination, the PTH and the phosphate would be high, there will be hypocalcemia, and of course, these children can also present with infantile hypophagia etc. And last but not the least, cortisol excess, so pushing syndrome. Um, and um, so we know, we all have seen probably uh, these children where uh, the children have been, because uh, steroids are used rampantly and in fact misused in all these children. So these children typically come to us with known faces and obesity and delayed bone age. And uh, we can do an overnight dexamethasone suppression test and come to a diagnosis. Uh, there will be other additional findings in the form of maybe hypertension and purplish stria, uh, which will again point towards Cushing syndrome. Thank you.